Well, this is Father McConville uh, beginning uh, our third talk on the call to holiness. And uh, I'm entitling this uh, particular talk, Into Action. Um, before we get started, though, I want to take just a second to talk a little bit about my methodology. Um, the overall purpose of this uh, series is to talk about spirituality. And often when uh, people deal with the topic of spirituality, uh, we look at things like prayer and, um, you know, what is prayer, different types of prayer, things like that. Well, we're going to get to that sort of stuff. But uh, before that, I wanted to sort of set the table in a, a much more um, elaborate way, perhaps, but in a, in a different way than uh, most talks on the spiritual life. Uh, and I wanted to start with basically us. What is it that uh, we as human beings uh, are working with in a relationship with God? Um, after all, God being uh, infinite and uh, beyond comprehension, uh, we can only estimate and uh, have some rough idea about, uh, but we certainly can know ourselves and understand uh, the limitations of humanity much more readily. So to look at uh, spirituality, basically from um, well, a somewhat practical point of view, why do we need the spiritual life? And how is it that the spiritual life assists us? That's really more my focus rather than just a sort of a, uh, uh, a series of talks on the theory, if you will, of prayer. So that's why I uh, entitled this particular talk Into Action, because it's a talk about how it is that we respond to this life of grace that we're called to live. So let's review. First off, we remember that human beings are made in the divine image, the image of God. We read that in chapter one of Genesis, very beginning of the Bible. And uh, we understand that this means that we have an intellect to know and a will to desire, and that <clears throat> this intellect and will uh, is, uh, is that spiritual component, that part of the operations of our soul. And as human beings, we also have a body uh, that our soul uh, enlivens and gives form to and uh, also receives its information through. Uh, we have the external senses that communicate to us uh, that we can know the world around us. So that's the first thing, we, that God created us and he reveals that to us in the divine image, meaning that we have a will and an intellect. And part of that will and intellect, that will is free. So we have a free, what we call a free will. And again, freedom meaning not able to do whatever we want, but loving and choosing what is truly for our good. That is, that uh, goodness by its nature is that thing which is desirable. I mean, it's by definition what something that is good is. And it's so therefore we always uh, are longing for good. I mean, we want the stuff that's going to satisfy us. But again, uh, as we'll see in a second here, we'll talk about the complicating factor. But the idea here is what is our ultimate good? How, why were we uh, created? Uh, what's our purpose, as it were? And so uh, this freedom isn't, like I say, uh, given to us as just to choose what we want, but that we're choosing uh, in a way that is unencumbered. It's free in the sense that it's not uh, a slave. It's not bound uh, by anything, which is where the complicating factor comes in, original sin. It wounds our true estimation of good and evil. And because of uh, that, that selfishness, that original act of disobedience by Adam and Eve, uh, we now have this, uh, this conflict set up that while we still see goodness and we recognize goodness in the world around us, uh, we unfortunately substitute that relationship, that union with God, who is goodness itself, 
with these pale reflections, as it were, of his own goodness. And that's what original sin did. It, it, it now takes that freedom, and instead of using it for uh, choosing what is truly good, we're using it basically to do what we want. So uh, freedom now is no longer seen with, uh, within the context of our uh, fulfilling and, and realizing, actualizing our nature as God intended us, but rather just to kind of selfishly pursue what we think will bring us happiness. And of course, first thing we have to realize is that what we think uh, doesn't amount to a whole lot because we're pretty finite, limited, fallible uh, individuals. So in any event, we've got original sin that's uh, kind of uh, making a mess of things. Uh, but nevertheless, that freedom still exists. God didn't just uh, chuck everything into the dustbin and say, okay, let's start over again. No, he created us within freedom because that freedom he acknowledges as a good thing and that it's going to work for our good. But because of original sin, because we can get this wrong. He gives us a little help. The grace that comes from him, which is really his love, <clears throat> so it's an actually, uh, it's a way of participating in his life. The virtues, which we remember are good habits that uh, assist us in knowing what is truly for our good and choosing with delight and eagerness what is truly our good. The gifts of the Holy Spirit that also help to um, strengthen those powers of our intellect and our free will. So all of these things given to us to overcome the wound of So let's begin in talking about how all of these things work as far as how our lives, uh, how is it that we in our lives can live in such a way that we can embrace this call to an intimate union with God in uh, a way that's going to be joyful, life-giving. Uh, fact number one, I am not God. That's a pretty basic fact, but unfortunately, um, we tend to forget that fact. And uh, as we recognize, that's really what sin is all about. We sort of take over God's job. Um, so some questions to ask. Uh, three questions, in fact, for us to consider in this part of our discussion. First, am I convinced that I need a Savior? Uh, that is, am I convinced that I'm not God and that my way doesn't work real well? And am I convinced that Jesus alone holds the solution to all my problems? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to win the lottery just because I pray. I'm pretty certain of that. <laughs> uh, well, to be honest, I've had past experience. But um, so that's not what we're talking about as far as the solution to all my problems. What What is my basic problem? My basic problem is I'm not God, yet I keep convincing myself that I can, of my own power, achieve my true and ultimate happiness, but I know I can't. So am I convinced that Jesus can? And am I convinced that uh, God's will uh, is, that is his plan for me, that's better than my plan for me? These are really, when you get right down to it, pretty important questions to answer if we're going to go anywhere in the spiritual life. If we're not convinced that we need a savior, we're going to keep going after stuff by ourselves, looking after our own good, using our own tools uh, that are at our disposal, which means we'll probably just end up living sinful lives. Am I convinced if I'm not convinced that Jesus alone holds the answer? Again, I'll turn <clears throat> to other sources, whether it be, again, to my own uh, abilities or maybe I'll start turning to things like a repu my reputation. That's what's going to bring me true happiness is if people think well of me, or maybe it's going to be wealth, you know, some of those tired old things that people go after. Uh, maybe I'm going to find my satisfaction in uh, 
you know, uh, in a bottle of booze or in a, uh, in a bag of weed or something like that. Um, yeah, if I'm not convinced that Jesus alone holds the solution, then I'm going to try to find answers in ways that are less than, less than what God would want for me. And finally, am I convinced that God's will is better than mine? And by God's will, meaning that God has a plan. God has created all of us for a purpose, given us uh, our souls. They're infused at the moment of conception, and our souls have certain temperaments, personalities. It's what makes each soul unique, and God's going to use them if provided we allow him to work in us. So am I convinced that doing it my way is not going to yield the results that I was created for? So those are the first three questions we really need to um, answer if we're going to advance. In these. So let's start with some uh, biblical quotes uh, where that kind of set up the conversation uh, first off, St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, makes a very basic uh, uh, observation, really. It's, it's sort of the, the fundamental reality that we all deal with. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very things I hate. we That's the, the root of sin, um, that sin is something that when we have been made aware of it, um, you would think we would just drop it. We'd run away from it. We'd see it for the evil that it is, how it doesn't complete us. It doesn't uh, fulfill uh, our ultimate happiness and all, the, and all the rest of it. But yet we don't. Yet there's still a part of us. Again, this is really Paul just crying out about the wound of original sin. The fact that we do those things that we detest, even and we have a very hard time, maybe even uh, fail to do what we want, what we know God would want of us. So when I say we all do things we know we shouldn't try as we might, but we also all do things we know we shouldn't and we don't try, as uh, and that's the problem. So. We, uh, we get ourselves into trouble because we don't try. It's precisely the point. So how often have I rationalized or minimized my bad behavior? It's a good question. Is um, I know I've got stuff that is not going to bring me happiness, but because of the sin, uh, original sin and its wound, um, there's still an attraction to it. Um, I find I derive some uh, thing that I measure as good uh, for me in it. And uh, when I'm made aware of the fact that, no, it does not serve my ultimate good, um, I kind of figure, well, my ultimate good's a long ways away. I'm young. I'm not going to die anytime soon. So, you know, I can get around to that later on. Um, I'll pursue this thing now or whatever it is, whatever reasons we get, we rationalize, we minimize, ah, it's not so bad, oh, I deserve it. We find lots of ways to, uh, to make our bad behavior, at least in our mind, acceptable. And so uh, the question, how often? Probably every day in one form or another. So that first question, am I convinced that I need a savior? Um, we do not see or admit what harm our sinful actions do to us spiritually. That's true. That our spiritual actions, when they are, when or our sinful actions rather, uh, they're harmful to us. They do harm us. What they do is a number of things. One, they uh, damage our relationship with God, with one another, even with ourselves. And uh, so that's the one thing: is that relationships are hurt. Uh, if not altogether destroyed. Um, also, they uh, establish a sort of habit within us. Remember, we talk about virtues are good habits. Well, a vice is a bad habit. And how do we acquire bad habits? By practicing bad actions over and over again. And they become ingrained in us. And uh, 
as a result. They uh, then <clears throat> make it more difficult to do the good and to choose the good. But the thing is, these things are happening interiorly and maybe we don't um, experience bad consequences uh, as a result right away. Uh, some bad behaviors, for example, uh, uh, getting uh, publicly intoxicated, um, you're going to get some maybe immediate consequences. Uh, you get arrested for uh, being rowdy or, uh, heaven forbid, getting into a vehicle and causing an accident or something. Yeah, sure, there I've got a, an immediate reaction, an immediate uh, consequence. But on the whole, yeah, I didn't tell mom the entire truth. Um, yeah, maybe she finds out later on, but maybe she doesn't. So I figure I pulled one over on her and got away with it. So I can feel smug and proud. Yeah, I don't feel the, the, the consequence. Maybe later on, if I reflect upon it, perhaps. But um, we don't see, like I say, or admit at least, the harm our sinful actions is, are doing to us. And we resort to sinful behavior often because we want to address our spiritual longing. Doesn't this sound like a paradox? But yet it's true. Again, God made us for a loving union with him. But because of the wound of original sin, we don't always make the right assessment of what is our good and what isn't. And as a result, we start replacing God with things, other behaviors, other items uh, are we think are going to be that one thing that's going to bring me, eh, maybe eternal happiness is too far off or too lofty a thought, but it's at least going to make me <clears throat> feel good in the moment. It's going to um, satisfy me for now, and maybe that's all the farther down the road I'm looking is the immediate future. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll turn, rather than to God, I'll turn to this behavior or this item, this thing. And, um, but when we, if we really stop and consider what's going on, these things or these behaviors that we are looking for to sustain us or to satisfy us, we realize they're just scratching an itch and they're not really taking care of what our ultimate longing is. God made us for a loving union with him. And so when we're doing anything other than pursuing that loving union, we are going to come up empty. We're going to feel, feel unsatisfied, unfilled, unfulfilled. So uh, this is the strange paradox. So, so what do we do? We just keep engaging more and more in these unsatisfying behaviors, these things that only uh, maybe give us a moment's, uh, if even that, um, uh, comfort. And because they fail to satisfy, we go keep going back. It's like the high wears off and we need it again. And of course, what happens? The repeated action becomes a habit. And there is the vice. So we, so we say, am I convinced that I need a savior? Well, if I'm just going to be in this cycle of um, pursuing creaturely things to uh, try to uh, fulfill that spiritual itch or what I call the God-shaped hole that uh, is within my, my being that only God can fill um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm not going to be convinced I need a savior. I'm just going to keep resorting to bad behavior. And the bad behavior is not going to satisfy ultimately. So I, you know, just rinse, repeat, as they say. So, again, we have to bear in mind that the wound of original sin obscures our true estimation of good and evil. So we, again, uh, aren't even necessarily thinking about our eternal happiness. We're just thinking about what's going to get me through uh, tonight or uh, the next few days or um, maybe a little bit longer, but we certainly aren't thinking in terms of eternity. And often that's why a creaturely thing uh, becomes attractive because it's ready at hand. It's um, the satisfaction we can derive from it seems immediate and uh, eternal just seems like it's too long and too far. 
So here's a, a term that uh, I came uh, that I came across. I certainly didn't come up with it, but I think it's a wonderful term, king baby. Um, it's a wonderful description, a title that wonderfully describes this whole thing of seeking out our own will, um, trying to satisfy uh, that eternal longing with uh, mortal uh, creaturely things is uh, it's because we are uh, because we're that's the type of person we are we're king or pure lady queen uh, baby and what do I mean by that well again as human beings while we have an intellect and will we also have instincts that form us in our if you will our animal self our sensitive uh, self that part of our uh, and our being our interior life that uh, uh, we share with all uh, animate life, all sensing beings. We've got instincts. We've got instincts for uh, companionship, for food, for shelter, um, all of these things um, that we, that all uh, sentient beings, all animals uh, share. And so, and they're, they're necessary for survival. We, we like being warm and dry because if we're cold and wet, we get sick. We like being full and and uh, uh, not parched, you know, because uh, these things mean that we're healthy, and on and on it goes. But our instincts um, do a couple of things. They they have a couple of effects, and one of them is that um, if we notice in nature this desire to um, control or to have dominance over a territory or over the resources in that territory, um, how a, a bull uh, moose will um, uh, want to have several uh, females uh, with which to mate. And so he'll mark out a territory and he'll chase away any other moose in the area or some uh, birds be, are very territorial because the resources are scarce in that area. And so they chase the other birds away so they're not competing for food. It's so a kind of a basic reason why these instincts exist is so that uh, animals are constantly uh, surveying their territory or constantly uh, looking to um, have some sort of uh, dominance in one form or another. And also avoiding pain. Well, you can say to seek pleasure, um, but <clears throat> sometimes um, the pleasure isn't there. It's just simply that it's not painful. Being hungry, uh, having a, a thorn in your paw, um, being tired, uh, being uh, having something hot on my skin, all of these things uh, are unpleasant. And so to be rid of them is pleasant, just simply that the cessation, the, the ending of pain. <clears throat> so we see that many of the instincts, many of our natural reactions as animals are uh, to do one of those two things or both of them, that we we seek to um, actually usually the avoid pain and often the control is how can I so structure the world around me so that I won't feel pain. Um, but that's kind of our basic, I mean, that's something that we share with, with all uh, animal life. But we have to uh, kind of admit there's a problem if we allow ourselves simply to function with regard to these two instincts. If we were to simply give ourselves to this natural uh, need to be in charge and uh, avoid pain, well, we got two problems. The first problem is we don't have much, if any, control over the world. Just uh, try spending a night in nature without any food, without a tent, um, and you know, no telephone, see how long you last uh, out in the wilderness. Uh, the world, and for that matter, other people, uh, really, you tell them, wait on me hand and foot, guess what, they won't. Um, so we really don't have a whole lot of control over the world, yet, yet the king baby, when we're, when we're trying to live these instincts of wanting to be in charge and wanting to avoid pain, well, um, that's a big problem, is that we aren't in charge and 
uh, people and circumstances and nature uh, reminds us of that fact pretty quickly. The other fact is that the world doesn't take care of us. Again, spend a night out in the woods uh, without any supplies and see how much nature cares about you. It doesn't, except uh, that it wants to make you part of it, uh, maybe uh, part of a uh, mountain lion's dinner or something. So the world doesn't take care of us. So as a baby, wanting the world to look after our needs, uh, you know, so avoiding pain, finding pleasure, um, <clears throat> the world just keeps moving, bumping along. And so as a result, if we're living seeking these two things, seeking dominance over a world we really have no control over, or seeking uh, the world's uh, taking care of us, uh, neither of those things happen. What do we do? We get resentful, we get angry, uh, and then either we just keep trying harder or um, we turn to uh, other things that we can control or things that we can use to help us avoid pain. And that's obviously where things like addiction uh, can. So, okay, if we're left to our instincts, we see that that's kind of a dead end. King Baby um, doesn't have a very, uh, very steady throne, it's rather precarious. So we need to go to Jesus. He's the one who offers the solution. We read in uh, Philippians, again, Paul writing to the church in Philippi, that rather he, that is Jesus, emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God highly exalted him. So here we see this beautiful hymn that St. Paul, uh, in which St. Paul speaks of our Lord's mission, that Jesus, the second person of the most blessed Trinity, condescends to uh, leave that heavenly throne and to dwell with us, as it were. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in doing this, he does this out of obedience to the will of the Father and also out of love for humanity that he raises us up. And he does so by dying on the cross. But notice, he humbled himself and became obedient. These two qualities are very important. As <clears throat> St. Luke points out as Jesus in the garden before he's arrested and taken before the uh, high priest and, and eventually Pilate and he's crucified, he's praying in the garden and he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup, the cup of his passion, away from me. Still not my will, but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. So here again, we see uh, Jesus not uh, trying to do things his own way, not being king baby, not saying, Father, please. You know, he's saying, if it's possible, if there's any other way around this, you know, I, I, I recognize and I recognize that, that uh, you know, it, take it away. <laughs> but in the final analysis, he realizes this is the necessary route. And so he says, not my will, but yours be done. And so we see again, these two basic virtues, humility and obedience. This is the solution. This is the way that the spiritual life is kicked off, that if we are going to just simply sit in our own king babyhood, uh, wanting the world to take care of us, and uh, we making sure everything is exactly to our liking, controlling our environment so that uh, we feel satisfied, neither of those things are going to happen. But if we can submit humbly, that is, we recognize we are a creature we recognize that we need God, and that that divine itch, as it were, that God-shaped hole in us was put there for a reason. That's part of humility is to say, it's not about me. And that obedience saying, not my will, but your will be done. That is, God, you're the one who created me. I didn't of my own willingness come into being. And so 
I have to uh, acknowledge that you are the one who is leading me on this journey. So humility, obedience, these two uh, virtues that are central. And so we can begin <clears throat> already in looking at the spiritual life, talking about prayer, what we normally think of when we think of spirituality. Well, here's our first prayer is, Lord, grant me humility. Lord, keep me on your path. You know, make me always eager to do your will and not my own. We can use our Lord's words. Father, if you're willing, take this cup away from me, whatever this cup might be. But still not my will, but yours be done. Thy will be done. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer. There you go. About as basic as you can get. So once we uh, kind of, once we get this set up, once we realize, again, God created us to be in a relationship with him. We tend to um, make a mistake what's our ultimate good. We confuse uh, sort of passing satisfaction with eternal happiness. And uh, we realize that uh, we've got a history. If we've lived any length of time, um, and uh, especially if we're into young adulthood, um, yeah, older adulthood too, it doesn't matter, but certainly uh, in the, in, as we're getting into uh, being responsible in the world, yeah, you know, I've misused my freedom. I've uh, done precisely the king baby routine. And as a result, I've damaged relationships. And as a result, I've also established some bad habits, um, some means of dealing with uh, my own pursuit of uh, my own thoughts of what is happy. So we have to add, again, three more questions for us to consider. Am I willing to make a searching and fearless moral inventory? And by a moral inventory, just like an inventory like you do in a shop, you know, you look at the shelves and see what's on the shelf. So what, you know, how have I acted in the past? What are some of my go-to vices? What are the... the the sinful inclinations and behaviors, activities or thoughts that um, I generally uh, tend to uh, rely on as part of uh, my uh, pursuing, you know, the, the reign of King Baby. Um, you know, do I give in to resentment? Uh, am I frustrated because people don't do things uh, the way I would want them to? Uh, do I... Uh, lie and try to make myself look better than I really am because I want to be accepted. Um, you know, on and on it goes. But that's the question. Am I willing to really look at myself? Am I really, 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 really willing to make that searching and fearless moral inventory? And the second question, am I entirely ready to allow God to accomplish his will in my life. Am I an entirely ready? Well, you know, entirely might take a lifetime to get entirely ready, but we're at least willing. Or we're saying, you know what, Lord, I'm tired of this. Uh, I've been doing it enough my own way, and I realize just how um, ultimately unsatisfying, how futile uh, this way of doing things is. So we, we sort of handle, we just maybe in desperation uh, are tired, whatever. Am I entirely ready to allow God to accomplish his will in my life? Thy will be done. And then the third question, can I humbly ask God to accomplish his will in my life? So on the, the one hand, I'm, I'm becoming ready and becoming willing. So there's that desire within me. And now can I act on that desire, humbly asking God to accomplish his will? Well, there's another prayer right there, as we'll see. Um, another prayer, another way in which we seek that, that spiritual connection with God, that deep, intimate, loving union with him. So yeah, so we got to clean house a little bit, uh, basically saying, okay, yeah, I've been king baby. Um, 
and uh, my my reign as king baby has not been particularly helpful. In fact, it's been kind of destructive, and so I, I really need to take some time and to consider that. And once uh, now I've, I've uh, addressed these things, I can start um, seeing more clearly where I need to turn my life over to God. So we start with that honest lifetime review. And um, what I, when I was in the Army, one of the things that they uh, taught me in the Army was uh, to do, after we'd go out and do some sort of a training exercise, uh, there would always be a little session afterwards. We'd all sit around together, everybody who, was, who participated in the exercise, and we would do what's called an after-action review. Um, this is sort of an after-action review of, of our life up to this point. Um, and the point of an after-action review is we, we look at, okay, we just got done doing this exercise, um, this, this training event. Um, what worked? We always start with that. What went well? And the reason we want to focus on that stuff is because we want to do it again. We don't want it to be a fluke. We want to become, again, if it's going to be virtuous, if we're doing good, we want it to become a habit. And we just become routine in our doing these things that are good. So, in this way, we can maximize the positive. But we also recognize, and again, sometimes we have to be, uh, we have to uh, suffer a little embarrassment or, you know, be self conscious that uh, some stuff didn't go well, and some of the stuff that didn't go well may be the direct result of my own pig headedness. Uh, so, there, well, let's not do that again. So we want to minimize the negative. So doing a, a, an honest review of our life, taking some time, and we don't have to do, you know, we can do this um, maybe every couple of years or every few months, whatever it is. But um, yeah, it should be something that we shouldn't be afraid to do. Again, this whole idea of am I ready to take an honest examination of my life why? Because I want to identify where I've been firing on all cylinders, where I've been connected with God. And I want to make sure that it's not just an accident, that it becomes habit, that it becomes a virtuous way of living. Where haven't I been? And often I can start seeing patterns in my life. There's certain behaviors at certain times that uh, come up because uh, uh, certain types of circumstances trigger those behaviors. Uh, for example, if I'm feeling really lonely, uh, I might be more susceptible to um, acting out in a certain way. Or if I'm really tired, or if I'm angry, or uh, just kind of um, needy, just not I'm feeling a, a, an unmet need, uh, so a little hungry, as it were. Uh, all of these things uh, can be uh, moments where I don't act like I should. Uh, so let's identify those, and maybe I start seeing patterns develop. Next, then, we recognize the ways King Baby has tried to solve our problems in the past. In other words, when have we tried to, uh, to control the situation? When have we uh, been, as a result, frustrated because the situation hasn't resolved itself to our liking? Uh, when have we... Um, depended on things or people uh, to, uh, to take away our problems, um, you know, that, that rather than turning to God, we're just wanting everybody to take care of us, and we get really uh, annoyed when people don't. Uh, you know, it's like giving someone the silent treatment, figuring that they'll feel bad and then talk to you, and, and uh, I, had that, I did that to my mom once, gave her the silent treatment. She was just grateful to not hear me talk for a while. Um, so she actually thought it was a good thing. So, you know, sometimes King Baby doesn't always get it right. Actually, almost all, every time King Baby gets it wrong. So can we honestly admit those unhelpful patterns? Can we appreciate helpful patterns? Again, we're trying to look in our life, examine our lives, and try to understand us. What is it that makes me tick? What is it that that um, you know that that is uh, propelling me uh, for the good or for the ill? 
um, that's that's part of it. So then there again, another prayer, another opportunity. Lord, help uncover in my mind. Show me, teach me, make me willing to look at myself. Give me the courage to uh, examine my life and give me the counsel, the wisdom, the understanding to see those things that have become unhelpful patterns and allow me to admit them. Help me to appreciate and truly own those helpful patterns. I think that's the other thing we can often fall prey to is we don't trust ourselves. You know, there's a certain distrust, I suppose, that's healthy. But when we're doing well, um, how often do we just kind of minimize that as well? Ah, yeah, it was just a, it was just a coincidence, whatever. Um, so where good happens, we need to be equally honest with that. As well. So this is where I call, and again, it doesn't originate with me, this three-step thing called name it, claim it, tame it. And uh, the name claim tame, uh, I learned that back in seminary, but it was a three-step um, approach to dealing with particularly the stuff that's not helpful. Uh, the bad patterns that I have uh, accumulated in life. So first off, name it. Call it out, identify it, and be honest about our, my selfish behavior. See, this is the thing. Um, our Lord uh, in the Gospel of John talks with a fellow named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a, was a, a member of the Sanhedrin or a leader of the Jewish people, and he comes to see Jesus at night. And in fact, in the Gospel of John, he shows up a couple of times, and he's always showing up at night. Uh, and our Lord, that gives our Lord a, an opportunity to comment on the darkness, that people do their bad deeds in the dark because they don't want anyone to see them. Well, you know, if you stop and think about it, if my bad deeds, if I'm doing them because I really think they're good deeds and everybody else should agree with me, why aren't I doing them in the daylight? The fact that I'm doing them in darkness indicates there's something going on in me, let's call it our conscience, that says, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. So if we name it, if we bring it into the light, then it can't hide. It has nowhere, uh, you know, no amount of rationalizing or minimizing or blaming others uh, will suffice. And also the idea of naming, especially in the Old Testament, is a very powerful thing. Adam, when God creates everything in chapter 2 of Genesis, um, God presents these, the animals to Adam to see who Adam's going to pick for a helpmate. And uh, whatever name, whatever Adam called the animals, that's what the animal was. So giraffes became giraffes because Adam called them giraffes. That the name has something to do with the essence of the thing, what a thing is. And so Adam, by naming the animals, also not only is he identifying their, their, their essence, calling them what they are, but also he is showing a certain dominion over them, power over them, because he's the one that gives them their identity by giving them a name. And so parents naming their children, it's like they're giving, not only do they give physical life, um, but they're also giving an identity to a child. So if we name it, we identify and we're honest about selfish behavior, we are uh, on, on the way to having that dominion and we're calling it for what it is. So claim it, don't minimize it, don't rationalize, don't shift the blame. Is yeah, yeah, that's what I do. I, I, um, you know, I tend to gossip. Okay, you know, call it out for what it is. I identify it, and I don't minimize. Sure, gossip is a is a popular thing people engage in because gossip is kind of like money. Uh, in this case, though, you're not buying a new pair of shoes. You're buying uh, people's attention. Folks will want to be around me if I've got this currency called uh, the, you know, the latest dirt. Um, if I got the dirt, then uh, I know people, again, because it's kind of pandering to our baser nature, people want to hear the dirt. And so uh, that's what makes me valuable. It makes me valuable if I've got dirt. 
Um, well, no, dirt is dirt. It's, it's not valuable. But you know, let's. But I'll claim it. Sure, I engage in this behavior, and that's the reason why I do it. And so finally, the taming it. Okay, the the little critter can't hide anymore. I've called it out for what it is, and I'm owning it. I'm I'm not trying to pretend it's not there or that it's somebody else's problem. And so now. I can turn it over. Ask God to help us deal with our selfish behavior. So that's the taming of it, is I'm not going to uh, try to cover it up. I'm not going to, again, hide in the dark and the shadows, but rather take it to the one who has the solution to all my problems. Bring it to God. Right? So that's the basic tame it. And then that second question, am I entirely ready? For change, well, entirely, entirely is an awful lot. Um, I don't know. So often, our uh, habitual sins and selfish behaviors are the result of our own attempts to play God. So that's where we we start. Is we've been we've been doing God's job for Him. That's basically how King Baby. That's who King Baby really is. It's it's God Baby. We want to be in absolute control of everything. Whether we want to admit it or not, the sooner we admit it, uh, the easier, again, we can move on and let God take over uh, the, the laying a course for us in our lives. But that's the result. That's the basic thing, is if we break down, if we look the fundamental motivation about our sinfulness is that we are trying to be God. We're trying to satisfy our longings by ourselves. And because we are finite creatures and we don't tend to be terribly imaginative, uh, the results that we come up with tend to be sinful. And as a result, because they keep, uh, we keep going back to them, they become habitual. So we have to acknowledge that. That's the starting point. Second thing is, as we turn our life over to God, I call these things maladaptations. Mal meaning bad and adaptations meaning adaptations. How we adjust to the circumstances around us. In other words, they're just bad ways of answering that question. So these maladaptations no longer serve a purpose. Yeah, because I'm no longer playing God. I'm letting God be God and I'm being his creature. And as his creature... Um, I recognize that these bad behaviors that I used to engage in, uh, well, they don't serve any purpose. And uh, what I thought, what good I thought I was deriving from them, I now see clearly that they don't give me what I'm truly looking for. So the more we turn our life over to God, we realize, we just start seeing, yeah, you know what, I don't need these things. These things aren't helpful. These maladaptations. They don't serve a purpose, but there's a catch. The catch is that these maladaptations, because they're habitual, they seem to be almost a part of us. Um, you know, you might want to call it, some people would just say, well, it's just my nature. You know, um, yeah, I bite people's head off. I get angry really easily. I fly off the handle and, and I throw stuff or whatever, you know, however I manifest my anger. And, uh, um, but that's just the kind of person I am, you know. I mean, I'm just I'm just hot-headed, and I'll always be hot-headed. No, um, no, that's not uh, hot-headedness. Um, you might be a little more more susceptible to um, to that, uh, but often that's again because I'm really edgy about my uh, being in control. And this is a good point to just to mention, I didn't put it on one of these slides, but the notion that are, you know, that so often fear, I may have mentioned this before, but fear tends to motivate so much of our sinful behavior. So either the fear of losing something we value or um, uh, facing something that uh, is undesirable, you know, there's something coming at us that we would rather not have come at us and so we're fearful that it's you know when we see the the nurse with the needle ready to plunge it in our arm you know we experience a little fear but it can also um be uh it can also be experienced uh as a as a frustration or an anger 
but often it's you know so that that fear if um, because I'm not in control and I'm angry I'm frustrated well but there's maybe fear underneath all that that fear of the unknown the fear of of yeah of not knowing whether or not I'm going to be taken care of so if I have a habit of that and if that's just become sort of my preoccupation yeah uh, it's easy to say well it's just a part of me no it's not it's not God would not create us to be awful people. <laughs> that's that's if God is all good and all loving, um, He's not going to say, you know what, I'm going to put, um, you know, uh, rotten scoundrel uh, genes in this character. No, um, we have to acknowledge the fact that our maladaptations. Yeah, they become habitual. They seem to become an inseparable part of us. But the point, in point of fact, they're not. Now, this can set up the further difficulty, the further difficulty that we don't, because we consider them to be part of our nature, we don't think we can live without them or we don't want to live without them. Um, you know, I'm, I, yeah, I'm a hothead. And being a hothead, though, people, they jump when I get upset and I get things done. I'm a really effective leader. My leader, yeah, because you're scaring the bejeebers out of everybody, and uh, and they're they're terrified to get out of line. So yeah, you're a very effective leader. Huh. Well, is that really um, a good thing? Clearly, the answer is no. And if it's not clear, well then, start at the beginning of the series again. All right. So we have to consider other more Christ-like strategies. Exactly. So it's easy to feel like, oh, my goodness, if, you know, but this is such a part of me. There'll be nothing of me left if I get rid of it. I mean, what's to become of me? Well, what's to become of you is to become you, uh, is the real us, the one that God it, uh, created us to be. Uh, to live that vocation he calls us to. So we, so where do we do that? Well, we give up playing God. We give up King Baby, and we try to be more Christ in our decisions and our actions. So there it is. Not my will, but yours be done. Our Lord's words in the garden. Uh, it's similar words in the Lord's prayer. Thy will be done. Uh, that's where again obedience, humility comes in. So. We, who do we look at as the great model of that? We look at the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I give you three um, uh, examples, actually, in Scripture of, uh, of individuals who uh, demonstrate this, uh, uh, these principles. But we got to start with Mary. So here we have, in Luke chapter 1, uh, the angel Gabriel coming to Mary, announcing that she's uh, being invited to be the mother of our Savior. And her response is, Behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. Thy will be done. God's got a plan for me. You've just communicated that plan to me. I'm going to accept that plan because God is proposing it. There is humility. There is obedience demonstrated by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Another example of Mary's uh, Humility and obedience comes in John chapter 2, beginning of John's, uh, the chapter 2 of John's gospel. We see Jesus at the wedding feast of Cana with his disciples and Mary. So apparently they were invited to a wedding. And during the course of the, the uh, wedding feast, you know the story, they run out of wine. And Mary, again, she's very attentive to uh, other people. She's not all stuck on herself. So she notices that they've run out of wine, and she knows who Jesus is, obviously. She's his mother. So she turns to him and says, they, they have no wine. And our Lord um, is not being uh, trying to shirk his responsibility, but he's really um, showing this interaction, I think a beautiful interaction between uh, Mary and himself that he says, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. You know, he's speaking about not the wine at the wedding feast, but his blood being poured out, which of course we recognize in the wine that becomes his blood in the Eucharist. 
So yeah, it's not time for him to suffer on Calvary. So, and, but um, but this interchange, he's uh, that he's telling Mary, you know, okay, uh, I've got other things going, and she's she knows that. And so she doesn't even argue with them. She doesn't even enter. She just turns to the to the stewards, to the servers, and says, "Do whatever he tells you." So she knows. She knows that Jesus will perform the first of his signs. But again, we have to be obedient and humble. So there's another beautiful example. Do what he tells you, because I did. So we come to, again, another prayer. And here's a nice prayer that I've come across, and um, I, I've uh, altered its language a little bit. But it's a great prayer for us in talking about um, wanting to turn our lives over to let King Baby uh, get off the throne. And just to pray, and why don't you pray that with me right now? My creator, I am now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my brothers and sisters. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Simple prayer. It's a simple prayer basically saying, I'm done doing it myself. Here I am, all of me, such as I am. I got good and bad. I acknowledge that. But I'm praying that you would minimize the bad and maximize the good. Please remove from me. I'm entirely ready. At least I'm entirely willing to have these maladaptations mal taken away. Defects of character, shortcomings, uh, bad habits. Call them what you will because they stand in the way, not only of my uh, in usefulness to you, but to my brothers and sisters. And usefulness, really recognizing not just being of service, but also being in relationship. And so as I go out, as I go on with my life, as I leave this moment of prayer, help me to always do what you ask me to do. Simple little prayer, but a very effective one of saying, but we look at, so, what, okay, we're talking about conversion. We're talking about King Baby's reign of terror. I want it to end. Um, I realize that Jesus has the answers, and that word conversion means to change course. And we see some changes, of course, in the Gospels that uh, sort of set us on that way. For example, in Matthew chapter 2, we've got the Magi. These uh, wise men from the east that see the star in the sky uh, announcing our Lord's birth. And so they hasten uh, to Bethlehem. And we're told that, um, well, first off, they stop by seeing King Herod. And King Herod is not the legitimate king of Israel. So he's a little nervous to hear that there's a newborn king of the Jews. So he sends the Magi to go find this newborn king. Uh, and he says, oh, I'll go do him homage too. No, he intends to kill him. Um, so uh, the Magi, after they've done him homage and given their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, we're told that an angel appears to them and that they return to their native land, having seen and having adored the newborn king. They, they return to their native land by a different way, a new way. And that's what conversion is about. They're taking a new way, a different path. They've encountered Christ, and they can't go back to the sinful ways of King Herod, who wants to destroy Christ. They find a new way to return home, a new way of being. So the Magi become uh, sort of a, a model of conversion. Then in John's Gospel, in chapter 8, we have the story of the woman caught in adultery, this woman that uh, the, the Jewish the Pharisees are using to, to try to trap Jesus. And, um, you know, he's the one that says uh, that he is without sin, cast the first stone. And they all realize that they're all guilty of some transgression or other. So they slip away until the woman's left alone. And Jesus says, is there no one to condemn you? And she says, no one, sir. And he says, and neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So here he's calling her to that conversion. 
Um, you've been a sinner. You see where that sinfulness can lead you. Um, fortunately, they led you to me and didn't leave uh, you to their own devices where they would have killed you. Um, look at this. I've shown you mercy, and I'm calling you to a new life, a new way of being. Go and sin no more. So there's a, a conversion story in John's gospel. And then we have in Mark's gospel, this uh, fellow the, called the Gerasene demoniac. That Jesus comes to this pagan territory, non-believers, non-Jewish people. And there's a fellow who's been afflicted by a demon, and he lives among the tombs, and he's rather violent to himself. And um, eventually Jesus casts not just one, but several demons out of him. They say, we are legion because we are many. And he casts them out into a herd of swine, and the swine all drown themselves. And this man, having been made uh, clean, having been cured of his affliction, wants to follow Jesus, wants to get in the boat with Jesus as he's about to cross the lake again. And Jesus says, no, no, go home. Go back to your family. You've been living among the tombs. You've been living in this, this slavery for a long time. They miss you, you know. So be reunited with them. And so again, an encounter with Christ. It cures him of his past affliction and sets him on a new course, a new course of uh, being a witness to his family of the power of Christ in his life. That's what we're talking about, that the conversion, um, we recognize, okay, I'm going to do things differently now. Well, part of doing things differently now uh, means we have to acknowledge that uh, what we were doing not only was not helpful for ourselves, but it wasn't helpful in our relationships. So uh, that's the first thing, is being able to admit the exact nature of our past wrongs. Can I admit those to God, to myself? That's the, usually the hardest one. And especially in the sacrament of reconciliation, can I share these things with my past wrongs with the priest honestly and exactly, not just I might have or I could have, but to truly and sincerely say, yes, I've done this. Yes, I've chosen to be disobedient. Um, can I do that? That's, again, three more questions. That's the first one. Second question, am I willing to make direct amends to those I've harmed in the past? You know, it's, it's important that we say we're sorry, but um, as we've probably experienced in life, just saying I'm sorry, and especially if we've had people come to us and say they're sorry, um, while we can be maybe uh, willing to forgive them, uh, how many times has that just simply set us up for the next round of disappointment? So, um, so that thing is, is that making amends, we'll talk about that. Can I try to, to set things right, not just simply say I'm sorry? And if uh, I can't make direct amends, if I can't deal with people for whatever reason uh, personally, can I just make my life now? Can I just kind of dedicate my way of being now as a sort of an ongoing uh, homage, as it were, uh, sort of I'm living in honor of that bad way I used to live before. Um, so it's what I call a living amends, or people will call it that. So let's look at these things then. Um, oh, yeah, and before we get to that, though, I should mention in making amends, um, saying we're sorry doesn't uh, always work. So there is this little thing um, that I was taught, the equation for restoring trust. How is it that you know, if we're going to try to heal these past wounds, um, how is it that we can do it? Well, there's an equation for that, and this is the equation. It's W plus A over T, and that equals trust. What is that? Words plus actions, W plus A, words plus actions, over time. That is, we know that our words, I'm sorry, um, if we just keep going back, to the same bad behavior, uh, our words are going to be pretty much useless. And so we need to accompany our words with actions, show people that we have in fact changed. And I say over time, yeah, it takes time. 
that um, it took time for people to distrust us. It's going to take time for people to regain that trust. So we need to be patient. And part of that is acknowledging the fact that we've, we've done wrong. And as a result, uh, we need, again, to make amends, but we need to stay the course, that this is not just a momentary thing. This is conversion. This is lifelong. All right. So, again, this personal inventory, this idea of can I admit the exact nature of my wrongs to God, to myself, to a priest in the sacrament of reconciliation? Well, the way that we can kind of get in a regular pattern of doing this is what we call the examination of conscience. It is we take a little time and we consider how uh, we've been doing. Like I say, it's a way to keep a personal inventory of how we have responded or not to God's grace. And, you know, kind of depending on what our need is. We can do it hourly. You know, um, I know one fellow who says he's got a little um, uh, alarm on his uh, smartphone that uh, people use for taking medication. And he uses it um, for his little spot checks throughout the day. So every couple of hours it, it goes off. And he says, okay, time to stop just for a second and see how am I doing. You know, it's like I tell people it's like driving a car. You know, when you're driving down the road, you're trying to keep your car in your lane, in the lane that you're driving in. You don't want to veer over the center line or you don't want to roll off the road into the ditch. And so what do we do? Well, we use the steering wheel. But we don't wait until the car is drifting into the other lane before we turn the wheel back into our own lane. No, we're constantly making little adjustments. You know, we feel the car starting to shift a little bit. We turn the wheel and we pull back into our lane. We're constantly doing that, keeping our eyes on the road and making sure that we stay in our lane. Well, that's what a little hourly or, you know, every couple of hours, that's basically what this fellow is doing is he's trying to keep the car in the lane, not allowing it to, to race off somewhere uh, like the ditch. Or maybe we do it at the end of the day. It's a good way to sort of finish off things, say our evening prayers, you know, now I lay me down to sleep or whatever we're in the habit of doing if we are, and hopefully we are. Um, but to just take a moment <clears throat> to do this little examination of conscience. Where have I responded to God's grace? Yeah, I think we're pretty good at where I haven't. We can point out our faults pretty quickly. But again, remember the after action report, after action review. We want to maximize the good. So not let's not maximize the bad uh, by focusing on it. Or we can do weekly, you know, maybe Sunday because we go to church. We have a little time in the pew, hopefully. We're not running in at the last second or coming in late. we got a couple of minutes to just, as we kneel down, uh, to ask the Lord to help uh, enlighten us and to un uh, unveil for us, reveal to us those things. Uh, or annually, some people go on a retreat. Um, um, people use journals, uh, daily write down things um, to do these things. Now you say, okay, great. I can see the value of an examination of conscience. What exactly am I looking for? How do I go about doing that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's a, a little formula I came up with. Uh, actually, I didn't come up with it. It was told to me and I've adopted and I like a lot. I call it Fred G. You see the first, uh, the initials of all those words has, uh, has been put in bold letters, F-R-E-D and G, Fred G, um, are kind of five things. They're the, they're five areas that I can look at in the hour or the day or the week or the year that I'm reviewing and consider uh, what's been going on. Fear, again, like I said before, fear tends to motivate us. Um, often we react out of fear, usually because we're afraid of losing something we don't ha uh, we we have or not getting something we want. So when have when have I acted out of fear? Um, resentment usually is a result of uh, not getting what I want or people not treating me because King Baby isn't getting his due. Um, so I get resentment. So where have I experienced that? Most of the time, I think that the greatest way of treating resentment is to realize that everybody else has a king baby that wants to rule their lives too. And if we can just have a sort of a, uh, an accommodation, that sort of generous attitude saying we're all dealing with king baby, uh, we can be a little more 
um, tolerant, as it were, uh, of other people. So, um, you know, so we ask, we try to become able to forgive. That's an important piece of that. And forgive in the sense that we acknowledge that everybody has King Baby on board to some degree or other. And we want people to be kind to us when King Baby in our life is taking over. So why don't we extend that same courtesy to other people? Ego, well, yeah, ego, selfishness, self-will. That's, again, those instincts wanting to be in control. And so when have I kind of pushed other people aside? When have I not been mindful of others? Mm, it's a good question. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's something like gossiping, like I mentioned before. There is ego at work wanting to, to get people to like me or think I've, you know, that they want to hang around me because I've got this currency, which is dirt. Uh, dishonesty. Yeah, dishonesty. That's where we're starting to go into the shadows. It's usually a good indication if I'm not being honest with other people, if I'm not being honest with myself, if I'm not being honest with God, um, then it's usually a pretty good indication that King Baby is trying to pull us into the into the shadows uh, and, uh, again, into that darkness. And, okay, those four things, not good things, but then gratitude is a good thing. Gratitude to be thankful, to recognize, again, where have I responded to God's grace, and to be grateful, A, that God has given the grace, B, that I've responded to it because I recognized it, and C, just, again, another prayer, just, Lord, help me to do that again so it's not just a fluke. Um, so there you go, another prayer, uh, that prayer of gratitude. Um, and I always like to point out, promptly admitting when we're wrong goes a long way. Uh, a, because it, um, if we promptly admit to ourselves, to another people, to especially those we've hurt, um, if we can admit that, uh, then uh, A, it keeps us from getting into the dishonesty. Um, we don't have to have a good memory to remember how many stories that I've told today. Um, but also it, it helps to... Um, uh, ratchet down people, other people's resentment towards us. They see, yeah, okay, what you did annoyed me, but you're acknowledging it, you're owning it, you're naming it and claiming it, so I can be a little more forgiving. How many times have we had that exact reaction when people who have harmed us acknowledged it? So what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, huh? Because if we can promptly admit our wrongs to other people, it's amazing how they soften towards us. And it's amazing how that relationship can improve. All right, a lot of information to cover in this section, but I think very important information that's going to help us talk about prayer. We can finally get around talking about prayer. But all of these things do have to do with spirituality, and I think that they are important uh, preparations for us before we consider uh, prayer and what prayer is about, uh, what it, the purpose it serves, and how we go about doing it. So let's conclude that, again, call, God calls us to a loving union with himself. That's why we were created and why we've been given the, an intellect and a will to know him, to love him, to serve him. And that as human beings, sadly, marked by original sin, we can be often misled and seek our eternal good in things other than God, things that aren't eternal and things that aren't uh, ultimately for our good. Yeah, we recognize that. So um, self-examination helps us better understand why we allow ourselves to be misled. We can be misled for a number of reasons, not all uh, bad uh, you know, uh, just bad decisions because we know they're, you know, because we're just being selfish. Sometimes we can act out of ignorance. We just didn't know any better. That's unfortunate. Hopefully we do know better. And that's the, the call to, again, to study, the call to uh, fill our intellect, get, to get our minds engaged. But self-examination does help us. We do see where King Baby is working and where his little kingdoms, his little fiefdoms are springing up in our lives and what maladaptations we've adopted in our lives, again, and what the motivation for those are. And self-examination also impresses upon us our need for God's help 
in experiencing that loving union he's called us to. The more we look at ourselves and the more we recognize our limitations and how we have failed uh, to turn to him and we've tried to just answer our own questions, um, then we, that makes us even more convinced we need to turn our lives over. We need to turn ourselves over to the loving plan of God in our lives. And finally, as we'll see in our next talk, prayer and meditation will become a habitual part of the process. We've talked as we've gone through this discussion about different prayers we can make, different ways that we can uh, continue that contact with God as we're seeking that conversion. So here's uh, our little into action talk. Uh, next time, uh, probably be our final session, we'll talk about prayer and meditation, these things that help connect us to God, bring us into that loving union, not only in our actions, but in every aspect of our lives.